Hello and welcome. Will Americans allow their president to reform the health care system? When he campaigned for the White House, Barack Obama said he would use all his political strength to change the way Americans get their medical care. But that promise may never be met. The debate over creating a government-backed health care system has brought out angry crowds at town halls across the country. The fights on America's airwaves have also become intense with conservatives warning against what they call Obamacare. They've also made extreme claims about the health systems in the UK and Canada in order to sway people against any kind of nationalized medical service. Liberals, on the other hand, are holding up the British and Canadian systems as models, arguing that in those countries, every person is guaranteed some sort of health care. Well, currently, the average American gets insurance through their employer, but many smaller businesses or the self-employed cannot afford health coverage, leaving millions uninsured. So with medical costs, uh, care costs expected to rise by nearly 10% next year, we look at the current realities in the U.S., U.K. and Canadian system, systems and ask, is health care a right or a privilege and who should be paying for it? Remember, you can join our conversation with your questions and comments. Log on to livestation.com forward slash AJE, enter the chat room and take part. And we'll also welcome your phone calls on the show. Joining me now for, uh, to discuss this from London is Lord Ara Darzi from, of Denham. Lord Darzi is a surgeon by training and just recently stepped down as health minister for the UK, where he oversaw many of the recent reforms undertaken by Britain's National Health Service. From Vancouver, Canadian Member of Parliament Ujjal Donsaj joins us. He previously served as Canada's health minister, where he instituted a $41 billion 10-year plan to strengthen Canada's health care system. And here in Washington, D.C., I'm joined by Dr. Tevi Troy, a visiting senior fellow at the Hudson Institute. He served as the Deputy Secretary at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services under President George W. Bush. Gentlemen, I welcome you all to the show. And Dr. Troy, if I could start with you first here sure. uh, in D.C. American, America's health care system is recognized uh, to be a major problem uh, in, in various fields, at least, with, for many ridiculous costs or a totally unfair accessibility. Uh, and yet any effort to reform it seems to get bogged down in partisan politics. Why is that? Well, unfortunately, we live in a very partisan time, so that, that's part of the issue. The other issue is that a lot of Americans, in fact, a majority of Americans who are covered with private insurance are very happy with their care, and they don't want to muck with the system. And that's one of the issues why this gets caught up in partisan politics. Now, the recent polls in the U.S. indicate the public's almost evenly um, uh, divided between wanting health care reform, resisting reform, and not knowing what to think. Um, so why, why is it so hard to get a clear debate on the issue and, and, and to create a straightforward plan of action? Is it this fact that people don't want to rock the boat, as you say? Well, there's so many people who are happy with what they have. At the same time, unfortunately, we've got about 15% of the people who aren't covered, and they don't have access, and we really do need to reform the system so that we can improve access. 82% of Americans do think there needs to be some kind of improvement right. of the system. At the same time, 52% disapprove of President Obama's approach. Lord Aradarzi, it's good to have you joining us as well, sir, there in London. Um, the British uh, traditionally moan about the NHS. I know this from having grown up in Britain. I mean, the National Health Care Service uh, is something that people love to complain about, and they, they say it's uh, failing. To what extent is that an accurate view, I mean, from the inside? Well, I think living in the UK, you'll appreciate that the NHS is not just a health care provider. It's very much part of our social fabric. Uh, the NHS is 60 years old. Last year we celebrated its 60th anniversary. Yes, as a society, we always want and wish to see the NHS improving, uh, but it's something that we strongly believe in. And uh, uh, you, you talked about right or a privilege. You know, every person born in, in England, in the UK, uh, by birth, has right to free access of care at the point of need, irrespective of their ability to pay. It's part of our society. Sir, is that the uh, clearest argument for defending the British system of nationalized health care then? If it's, if it's put to the Americans as to why uh, there, would, there should be a nationalized health care system, would that be the clear argument? Well, I, I, I don't believe it's the, it's the model that we have in the, in, in the UK or the NHS is the right model for the US. But, uh, you know, we do look up uh, to the US in many aspects of life, and I, I, I strongly believe that a... A, a developed nation like the U.S. should at least uh, ensure or guarantee that uh, all its citizens have access, uh, free access to health care. Uh, I'm not suggesting that it should be a nationalized system. Uh, I think they have the mechanisms in which uh, they, they deliver or, or, or the types of payers they may have uh, in, in, in providing that health care system. Uh, but I strongly believe there are two problems. Firstly, the universal coverage, how you achieve that, is a U.S. issue and it needs a U.S. solution. But I think more seriously, I think the biggest challenge to the U.S. healthcare system is the cost, is the escalating cost. 16% of the GDP, 
you know, it's not just healthcare, it's having a huge impact on the economy uh, if those growth rates are, are maintained. Well, let's get uh, Ujjal uh, Dosanjin from uh, Vancouver, and good to have you with us, sir, as well. And Canada seems to be somewhere in between the U.S. and U.K. when it comes to its system. Um, is there something about the Canadian system that works so well it could prove to be a model for, uh, for others? Well, you know, that's really up to the United States of America as to what they do. But I do believe that public option is the one that actually reduces cost. If you look at the United States of America, 30% of the total money that's spent on health care is spent on management of the health care, whereas in Canada it's 1% of the total budget spent on managing health care. And uh, we spend 10% of the GDP on health care, and the U.S. spends about 17% plus 3% on actually litigation. Uh, and I, I believe that all of that simply leads one to the conclusion that the U.S. needs a public option. Uh, and public, uh, you know, the, the president should not take that option off the table. If, if you really want to cover every American, give every American the right to have uh, health care, um, then the public option is the way to go. In Canada, um, in the public option, the doctors are private entrepreneurs. They are paid fee for service. Um, it, it's not nationalized in that derogatory uh, way people look at the word nationalized. It's a public health care system funded by public dollars. You, you know, all of us pay for it, and each of us receive the care that we need. And it's guaranteed. It's a right. It's not a privilege in Canada. And many of the uh, provinces, in fact, have no health care premiums. Um, it, uh, the health care is entirely funded by, uh, uh, by uh, income tax, whereas uh, some provinces do have premiums. Let me uh, um, get back to Dr. Troy here then. The fear-mongering in the U.S. over uh, certain issues such as death panels has left a lot of people actually alarmed, the public alarmed. They believe that, you know, there could be an effort to, to filter out people and that, you know, people who might be terminally ill or maybe suffering, you know, severely infirm or something could actually be uh, encouraged to, to end their lives as well. Um, to, to what extent is that, I mean, a realistic debate uh, to even be having at this stage? Yeah, well, first of all, let me say, I agree with uh, Lord Darcy that it's just because the British may like their system or he approves of their system doesn't mean it's the right system for America. Right. And I, I think that Americans are, uh, are an impatient people, and um, I, I don't think they're willing to put up with some of the waiting times that you see in some of these other countries. And I think that the talk of death panels really gets at this issue of rationing. I don't know if the, the death panel thing is accurate, and it's pretty clear that it's not no longer going to be included in whatever system we're talking about. Mm -hmm. But there is this real fear of rationing that, that instead of uh, a market mechanism determining who can pay for care, and, and there is something to be said for people paying for their care, uh, the, the fear is that with rationing, you'll have some government bureaucrat deciding who shall get care and who shall not. Well, let's get, uh, get to uh, Lord Darcy here and uh, talk about a whole series of TV ads that uh, were in the U.S. campaigning against a public health care system, sir, uh, using the British NHS as an example of how it wouldn't work. Let's take a quick look at this, uh, this advert. $22,750. In England, government health officials decided that's how much six months of life is worth. Under their socialized system, if a medical treatment costs more, you're out of luck. That's wrong for America. Life and death medical decisions should be made by patients and doctors, not politicians and bureaucrats. Tell your members of Congress to oppose government-run health care. Lord Darcy, that reflects on what uh, Dr. Troy was just talking about now with the rationing. And, and I wondered, you know, being in, inside the, the National Healthcare System uh, Service in, in Britain, do you know of any such kind of filtering that's ever taken place? Listen, I, I work in the health service. I've been a consultant uh, surgeon with an, uh, with an interest in oncology for the last 20, 20 years, and that's the most ludicrous thing I have ever heard uh, when it comes to these debates about uh, death panels, you know, the idea that people are using fear as a weapon against reform, I think is the most distasteful thing uh, that you can do in any form of a mature uh, debate. Uh, you know, we have, uh, you, you know, the other suggestion about waiting times, I could give you an example. I mean, you know, our system has itself gone to a serious reform over the last decade. The waiting times now from the point of referral from a general practitioner, by the time you have your diagnostics, your operation is all done in 18 weeks, something we're all very, very proud of. Uh, so, uh, you know, back to, back to the discussions here, you know, 25% of our patients 
who having heart bypass surgery are above the age of 75 and I could go on and on and on right. uh, so you know the system we have is has been reformed we're very proud of it and uh, I think a lot could be learned from our system uh, but as I said earlier you know you can't just take some package from one country and try to transform it into another Let's bring in Ujjal Dosanjan here, Dosanjan here and uh, look at a commercial that was uh, targeting the Canadian healthcare system, which featured a woman with a brain tumor. Look at this one, sir. I survived a brain tumor, but if I had relied on my government for health care, I'd be dead. I am a Canadian citizen. And as my brain tumor got worse, my government health care system told me I had to wait six months to see a specialist. In six months, I would have died. Government runs health care in Canada. Care is delayed or denied. Some patients wait a year for vital surgeries, delays that can be deadly. Many drugs and treatments are not available because government says patients aren't worth it. This is Osanj, another, another case of uh, sort of fear-mongering about uh, government-backed or government-run health care. Um, how many people do you think in Canada believe that to be the case? Uh, very few people, almost none, because there are no death panels here. Doctors decide what treatment to uh, provide, but what care to provide. And all of the doctors, 99% uh, of the doctors and specialists are private entrepreneurs. In fact, some people might argue that it is, uh, it is good for them to be giving care because they make more money. So, you know, bureaucrats don't decide what care to give. It's the medical doctors that look mm -hmm. after you. And, uh, and, that, and that particular um, uh, um, commercial, um, the woman didn't have the tumor she claimed she had. It was a different kind of tumor, and she could have waited. And, and you know, in, in our system, if you need urgent care, you get to the front of the line. Yes, there is some waiting. That waiting has been reduced for the last several years. It's, it's, it's being reduced as we go. Gentlemen, I'm going to ask you to stand by because we take a short break here. As we pause, let me remind you, our viewers, you can join the conversation with your questions and comments by logging on to livestation.com and entering the chat room where there's a debate taking place right now. We'll be right back.